morning. This is Pastor Wright from the Merritt Park Baptist Church presenting our audio uh, tape of Sunday morning's worship service titled Demonic Possession. Uh, before we get started in the sermon, I would ask that uh, you bow with me now in a word of prayer. And our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you have provided for us. We ask that you will lay your healing hand upon those that have been put on our prayer list and those, Lord, who are listening to this audio this morning who have their own prayer requests for family and friends. We ask that the Spirit of God will be felt in our services as we continue to witness to our communities, to our families, and to the co-workers that we work with. Again, we ask for forgiveness of our sins, for we pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles close by, please turn to the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7. It reads, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When, when I read this scripture, I often share with Christians who are having difficulty in their life because they have wandered away from the relationship that they have with God or uh, they're out of their church and back out into the world. Um, we get involved in things that uh, we're going to eventually have to answer for somewhere at some time in our life. The Bible says that if we resist the devil, that means that we have to put up some sort of a, a fight. We just can't wave the white flag and just go on and uh, follow the lead of Satan and get back out in the world and do the things we used to do. All of us who are listening to this audio this morning have demons in their life. We've often heard people say, what demons do you have in your life? And when I think about that saying, I, I think about how hard it is for us as individual people to try to live a life that is pleasing to God and at the same time try to deal with the demons that are in our lives. Now, one of the things that I want to share with you this morning that's very, very important is that people are going to have opinions over everything that is mentioned in the Scriptures. Uh, there are people that have opinions about uh, the tribulation period. Uh, they have uh, uh, opinions about uh, the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, but they will also have opinions uh, about demon possession and uh, demon influence. It is difficult for us as individual people to live a life without sinning. And when the sin comes into our life, I believe that it comes in because we open the door for Satan to enter into our lives, even if it is for just a moment. Once the, the idea that Satan wants to present to us comes into our heart or into our mind, most likely we're going to act upon that unless we go to the Lord immediately and ask God to uh, uh, bless us and give us more grace in dealing with our hardships. As we deal with these demons, uh, some may also call them vices. Uh, people will say, oh, what kind of vices are you facing every day of your life? Um, in essence, it's the same thing. It is something that pulls us possibly away from our relationship with God. And, and when we are pulled away from our relationship with God, um, it brings about this great dread of, of realizing what we have done and the guilt feeling that we have about coming back to God and asking God to forgive us for what we have done. But this is really routine for Christian people. We go out, we do things we shouldn't do, we, we have this guilt feeling about it and we get back in the fold of, of the church and back in the relationship with God and, and this is how it's always been in, in most of our lives. If you ask your friends what sins they have in their life that have been lifelong, you're going to be surprised to find out that most of the things that they are participating in today, uh, there may be a few of them that have been lifelong for them. So we understand being a Christian is the toughest job that you're ever going to have in your entire life. 
and the battle that you have ongoing with the demons in your life or the vices in your life is that of Satan who wants to make sure that none of God's children are going to benefit from any blessing from God because Satan doesn't want that. Satan does not want you to praise God. He doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want you to, to, to get involved spiritually with God because it may just change your life. Satan doesn't mind if you go to church. He doesn't mind if you give an offering to the church. He doesn't really mind if you sing in the choir or work around the church. The thing that Satan hates the most is anyone proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. And he will do everything in his power to upset that relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit and with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many times have we heard someone say these words? The devil made me do it. In reality, the, the devil uh, is not going to go ahead and uh, do anything um, you're going to have to do the act yourself. He can influence you and, and uh, uh, guiding you to the area in which your heart has a desire to be at. Uh, but he cannot force you to do something that you do not want to do. And, and the important thing is, is the influence of Satan runs rapid uh, in, in all of our lives. A possession of demonic behavior is totally different. So we're looking right now at the influence that Satan has on us. I, I'd like to share with you a, a true story because uh, I was a deacon at Harford Baptist Church, a member of the, the police department and worked in undercover narcotics, and you've heard me say this a number of times. But <clears throat> I considered my life to be, uh, uh, on an average, pretty good uh, spiritually, uh, but there were ups and downs. My biggest problem that I had was with a job that I loved, uh, I'm going to say, uh, pretty much with my whole heart. Uh, I loved the Lord, but um, I, I found that this job had taken hold of me, and I enjoyed my work more than I enjoyed my relationship with God. You may have, have uh, experienced the same thing, but, but let me say this to you, and this is important. I will never forget the day that there was something that happened uh, on the police department that upset me, uh, and I mean upset, taking my uh, uh, belief in God and threw it out the door. And when this event took place, I wasn't expecting it. And, and, and I, I had a hard time dealing with it. And I, I'm not uh, uh, proud of what I did on that particular day. But let me just say this to you. I had taken every part of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I spent half a day cursing God, the Holy Spirit, and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the moment, the moment that I started doing that, I was being pulled farther and farther away from the church. I actually had the belief during that uh, span of that afternoon that uh, God didn't even exist. He couldn't possibly exist in, in, in letting the things happen in Baltimore City that I saw. So my relationship was off the track, and, and, and I had a very difficult time uh, going back and asking God to forgive me of that. But you see, I was taught by my Sunday school teacher and my pastor and my fellow deacons as, as uh, I was growing up that uh, we all sin and come short of the glory of God. But on that day, my sin was, was worse than any I believe that I have ever committed before because there was not a name in the vocabulary of, of sailors when they get mad that I did not direct toward the Trinity and that is God that, that gave me the, the life that he did, Jesus who died on the cross for my sins, and the Holy Spirit who was my companion. And when I cut loose, you could have seen with your own eyes a drastic change in one of God's children. And, and I felt that, and, 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 and it upset me uh, immensely that I, I was able to do that. I was so embarrassed, not, not the people around me, 
uh, but I was embarrassed that I had to go back to God and ask God to forgive me for something after I had torn the Trinity apart. And uh, it took me a little bit of time to do that. I had to sit and do it. And, and when I started praying and asking God to forgive me, uh, I was sincere about that. I knew I should not have done it. I had no reason that I, I, I would even do it except the old saying, the devil goes to and fro. That, that's what the devil said in, in, in the book of Job. I go to and fro. And, and I just happened to be at a place where he stopped and he just happened to choose me to be a representative of something that I should not have been part of. Now, those of you that will sit back and judge me and say, well, I, how can a man be a man of God and tell that story without uh, people thinking that he was not saved? I was saved. I knew I was. I, I knew I was saved when I was 15 years old, and I had a good relationship with God, but I had ups and downs just like you do. But on this particular day, I'm telling you, it was like no other day I ever lived. You may have been at one of those days where Satan just happened to become to and fro and something happened in your life and it disturbed you so much that you cut loose on God, the church, the ministry, uh, everything that represented the church, you perhaps blasted with uh, uh, vulgarities. Uh, people do that. And the devil sits back and, and he looks at us and when we're ready to repent, he reminds us, why would you go and repent after what you've said or what you've done to the God that you say that you love and serve? But the reality is this. This is the game that the devil plays. For those of you that have been carrying this kind of guilt, I'm telling you right now on this day, God will forgive you of everything that you have done. All you have to do is ask him, be sincere about it, and then move on with your life because God gives us the grace that we need every day to survive as a Christian. Let me read a passage of scripture to you from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 4. Uh, it's talking about Cain and uh, his anger. And uh, we start with verse 6. Why are you angry, said the Lord to Cain? And why hast thou countenance fallen? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you refuse to do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. You are its object of desire, but you must master it. So what is this passage of Scripture saying to us? Uh, it's telling us that when we leave our home, sin is crouching right at the door. That means it's ready to present itself to you. And, and when we, we go outside the comforts of our home, our Christian home especially, and we, we uh, have left the place where we have fellowship with the Lord morning, noon, and night at our home, and we open the door to go outside, we are going on the front lines of spiritual warfare. The devil will attack us at any given time, and we need to be ready for that. So that scripture also tells us one very important thing, and that is that uh, we know now that sin is crouching at our door, and the Bible goes on to say that you are its object of desire, but you must master it. So every time you walk out your door, you could be attacked by the devil at any given time. You can be attacked by, by the, the, the devil and his influence in your home. But, but uh, especially when you're walking outside uh, out of the comforts of your Christian home, um, you need to always be aware that there are snares and traps of the devil that can pull you right in to his game plan. He can present something to you. If it appeals to you, you may take it hook, line, and sinker. So when does Satan or one of these alien spirits come into an individual? And, and it, it, they come at um, just the right time. Uh, Satan could be to and fro in the world, and uh, he appears and then enters into somebody uh, for that person to react 
uh, in a different way, as he did with a man by the name of Judas. Judas was one of the 12 that, that Jesus had chosen, and uh, on one particular day, the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Luke chapter 22, verse 3, that Satan enters into Judas. Now, prior to that, there was no uh, camaraderie between Judas and Jesus. And as the story is told, that uh, once Satan came into Judas, Judas then began to plan how he was going to betray Jesus by the scribes and the Pharisees and was given 40 pieces of silver. But something happened in between that time, and maybe it was his conscience saying that I, I shouldn't be doing this. So he wants to go back now, and he wants to give the 40 pieces of silver back to, to, to those that gave him the money to betray Jesus. And uh, at that point in time, it was too late. Uh, things were already written down as they were going to be according to the will of God and according to uh, the events of the Bible. And, and uh, he leaves, and after he leaves, he uh, takes his own life. Now, the interesting thing here is that he agrees after Satan came into his life that he would betray Jesus. He betrays Jesus with the kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes back. He now says, I don't want this money. What I did was wrong. And he had a, a, a feeling of guilt with it. And it didn't say that the devil left him at that point in time. It just says that he gave the money back. But you see, the devil already had a hold on him. And it is my belief that he had so much remorse over what he had done that he had taken his life. And that's what happened with Judas. So as we as individual people try to live our life right for God every day and try to do the things that God wants us to do, we have to be careful of our surroundings. That is important for every Christian of every denomination now, to remember today. let's take today. a look at um, signs of demonic possession. Uh, signs uh, of demonic uh, possession would be that the individual that is possessed by a, 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 a demon or, or some entity uh, would have knowledge of a foreign language that he or she hasn't studied. That's number one. Number two, he or she would have knowledge of hidden things. Perhaps it may be something about uh, a person that's in the room or somebody at work or something that has to deal with hidden things that, that comes uh, uh, to, to this individual's knowledge and then they spout it out at a given time. Uh, the extraordinary strength that a possessed person has is uh, almost uh, unbelievable. And then you have what are called the, the sacred things that are upsetting to that demonic possessed person, such as a crucifixion or such as a Bible or holy water. Now, we don't see any of those signs that I just mentioned to you uh, in the life of uh, Judas. Uh, we simply have read that Satan came into him. It does not anywhere that I could find uh, say that uh, he had knowledge of any foreign languages or he had extra uh, uh, strength that was uh, uh, that could be recognized as being something unusual or that he had any fear of being around Jesus or around any of the sacred relics that may have been there during that period of time. Uh, and it does not uh, indicate that he had any knowledge of any hidden things. So we have a situation of an individual person who simply is under the influence of what Satan wanted him to do. There are three levels of demonic possession, and they are uh, what is known as the mild state, a medium state, and a severe state. Uh, the mild being uh, that uh, this is just a beginning part of a, a, a very uncomfortable situation that is beginning to manifest in the uh, body of a individual person. It could be male or female. Uh, the severe state 
being the latter part, uh, is where the manifestation is at its greatest. So uh, we look at the in-between being the medium where they're uh, uh, beginning to get farther and farther away from reality and uh, their appearance and things that they say, the things that they do uh, are, are going to affect um, the people around them and how each person will handle that manifestation. Now, the other thing that we want to look at is has this this um, manifestation of demonic possession uh, increased over the years? The answer to that is yes. And I, actually, it started back in the 80s with the one movie that came out that everybody was talking about, and that was The Exorcist. Added to that movie, we then find that there's been an increase in satanic worship. And uh, even though that the increase of satanic worship is there, that is a whole new subject that we can talk about because there are many satanic churches in our neighborhoods. There are many satanic signs that are around us that we really are unaware of. In fact, uh, I said to the congregation not long ago that the spiritual warfare is spreading uh, all over the world worse than this uh, virus that we are now experiencing. It's much, much worse than that, but, but we don't have the knowledge. People aren't interested in biblical things. They're not interested in, in anything other than the new gods that many of them are serving, and that's where our problem lies. So let, let's take a moment now and uh, ask ourselves uh, how much we really know about uh, demonic possession. And I, I think it would be safe for us to, to say that uh, we as lay people would not know much about demonic possession unless we did an in-depth study of it or unless we wanted to tell somebody about a movie that we just saw uh, something to deal with uh, demons or Satan, uh, because that's where most people get their information from. Uh, watch a horror movie, and uh, you, will, will, you will get the understanding of what a demonic being is. It's these creatures that are scary. People want to be scared when they go to see movies like this. But in real life, if you see these things going on, it will horrify you. Now, one of the things that I think is important that we need to know is that uh, the, the, the demonic uh, being or entity uh, sometimes will leave a scratch on a person, and there'll be three lines that will go on either the arm, the back, the leg, or, or wherever that person is scratched at. But here's the thing that is called the, uh, what I call the litmus test, to find out if these scratches are authentic and are they definitely from a demonic uh, um, entity, or are they self-inflicting by a person? A sign of a demonic scratch on someone where somebody would say to you, uh, look at this scratch, that's the devil. The devil scratched me last night. The devil scratched me today. And, and people will look at that. But here is the test to find out if this is truly demonic or not, or if it's self-inflicting. A scratch from a demon will never show blood. In other words, it will not bleed as a scratch that you may get if you're walking through the woods and you get a scratch on your arm where it will bleed just a little bit. The scratches will appear, but there will be no blood. No matter how much you prod uh, that, that, uh, that scratch mark or how much you push on it or how much you would squeeze it, there would be no blood that would come out of it. It's actually, from what I read, it's dead skin that's around there, and uh, a lot of times people will say, okay, uh, I was uh, attacked by a demon, when in fact, if you look at this individual and, and you look carefully at it, there'll be no blood. It will just be a, the red scratches. Now, many, many years ago, they used what was called a bodkin, a bodkin, excuse me, that's B-O-D-K-I-N, and it was a, a test that the elderly people would use. Um, and a bodkin is a long pin that fastens the hair back 
uh, on an individual's head. So women used to wear these. Your grandparents probably wore these. Uh, grandmother, I should say, would probably uh, be able to, to share with you that this long pin was used uh, not only to hold the hair back, but it can also be used to detect uh, whether or not a scratch on a person was truly demonic because the, the hairpin, if you turn it over to the, the one end of it, it's got a small ball on the end of it uh, to kind of hold on to when you pierce it through the, the, the hair to hold it down in its place. They would take this uh, a botkin and uh, they would uh, turn it over on its uh, side or the end of it where the ball was uh, ready to be placed on the, the, the scratch or near the scratch. And if they pushed down on it, uh, there would be severe pain. And this was uh, done many, many years ago by people who had dealt with witchcraft and demonic uh, 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 things that were happening. Now, a lot of times when people say that they have been possessed by a demon or a demon has made a mark on them or a scratch on them, uh, it's going to be a definite mark. You will definitely see a mark, but once again, there will be no actual blood around the scratches. Uh, along with the scratches, uh, you may find that somebody has uh, reported that a demonic uh, being or entity has uh, bitten them. Now, the bite mark can be anywhere on the body, but here again, uh, the body uh, is going to show the mark. Uh, it will be bruised. Uh, the skin may be broken, but there will be no blood on or around the bite mark. There have been some reports that uh, people have uh, made comment about what looked like a snake bite on the arms of um, addicts or alcoholics or people who are living in uh, the world, uh, but that is speculation. I've not found a lot of information about that, but the bite marks or what appeared to be the snake marks um, resembles the serpent from the Old Testament, and it is a mark put on not all of these people, but on some of them. So please understand, I'm not saying because your son or daughter or friend or relative uh, is using drugs or alcohol that you are going to find a, a, a bite mark, what looks like a serpent's bite, on them. Uh, so that's just for information. It's out there. I'm presenting it to you for you to digest in any fashion that you would like. But one of the things that I do think is important for you to understand is what's out there that may affect your children, and it may be in your home today. And that are some of the games that the children play uh, on these uh, little um, uh, devices that they get at the, the, the store. And that's those, those games where they spend hours and hours and hours playing. Um, I was speaking to, to someone whose son had uh, a, a game and uh, showed it to me. And I happened to look at before uh, opening it up, uh, it looked like a number eight that was sideways. And um, when you tapped onto it, it came to the game. Now, the thing of it was, was that when you got on the game, it was a demonic-looking game. It was like something that you would find uh, where they have to deal with the walking dead, uh, shooting and killing zombies, things like that. But the marking on the outside of it was just a, a look like an eight, the number eight, sideways. And the, the surprising thing is, is when I was doing some research on that, that is called the infinity mark. Now, the infinity mark is, is on a lot of different things. As we stop and, and look at them, there are a lot of different things that uh, uh, is out there that carry that um, distinct marking. Uh, the infinity sign means wholeness and completion. So if the infinity mark or label uh, is supposed to mean wellness and completion, there are some who are uh, going to disagree with that marking being on any kind of a game that uh, your children are going to play. 
because uh, some of the games, as I mentioned earlier, have a lot of um, uh, photographs and pictures of demonic uh, beings and the Walking Dead and things that, that we probably wouldn't want our uh, children to be a participant in, in playing, but they're out there. We need to be aware of that. Um, there are also a lot of the games uh, out in the Disney um, uh, website uh, that has the marking of the infinity on that. Uh, and some of these, in fact, there's about 38 that I counted. It doesn't mean that these videos are bad in nature. It just simply means they're supposed to be wellness and completion. And, and that's the interesting thing that uh, we want to look at. But could they... Uh, have some kind of message on those videos that would lead back to something that is satanic or something that somebody may say, look, I don't want my child to, to see this video. I don't want my children around this type of video because I just have mixed feelings about it. Let me give you an example. Um, if we were to look at um, Sleeping Beauty, uh, we know that Sleeping Beauty, uh, there was a witch involved in that uh, Disney film, and uh, for the most part, never did bother us growing up whatsoever, but uh, there may be some parents out there who say, well, I don't want my children watching that because it does portray a witch in a child's movie. Uh, simple TV shows that we watched, uh, for example, the, the, the show called Bewitched many years ago that was on TV. Uh, it, was a, it was a great family film. Everybody enjoyed it, that watched it. And um, what some people came back and said, I, won't, I don't want to watch it because it's got to deal with witchcraft and they're making witchcraft seem to be something that was pleasant and people might take the wrong message in doing that. Harry Potter is, a, is another movie. Um, some of the kids watch it. Some of the parents don't want their kids to watch it because uh, of the content of it being to, to some looking as if though it was about sorcery and witchcraft and things like that. And, and it was, but it's how we teach and raise our children and how we're going to understand uh, what is good and what is bad for our children. So there's nothing wrong in asking questions to your children about let me see the games you have on your phone so I can view them to make sure that uh, you're not going the, the wrong way in life. Uh, there are churches that are named Infinity. There are campgrounds named Infinity. Uh, there are four Bibles named Infinity. When you go to search for Bibles to, to buy, it doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that they are Infinity Bibles, which deals with wellness and completion. There are colleges named a, a Infinity. And, and as we go on down the long list of things, we stop and we say to ourselves that uh, just about everywhere we look, we may find the symbol of infinity or even down on um, some of the places that we travel. For, for example, I pulled up just out of curiosity uh, some cruise ships and there was one by the name of infinity uh, and uh, it was supposed to be a, a wellness and completion. Nothing wrong with that. But here, here's the argument that some people have about um, the cruise ships and where they go. It may be wellness and, and completion, but uh, some of these cruise ships may go to areas that you don't want to go uh, to, and that could be Haiti, for example. And uh, if you go to Haiti and never been to Haiti before, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, things going on there that um, raises the eyebrows of Christians even being in that type of an environment. Uh, with having a witchcraft or voodoo of some sort. Um, and if you look at some of the, the uh, comments that were made about people who uh, traveled to some of these places, it was a nightmare for them. Uh, they had nothing but problems and issues while they were on these particular trips. So it depends on the individual person, what he or she feels that they are capable of handling uh, that's not going to pull them over to the dark side of life. Uh, so, so we want to make sure that we understand that. Now, I, I want to wrap this up uh, these next couple of moments to just share a few things with you that uh, I, I did not put in the earlier part of this, uh, this sermon. Uh, a, an individual person may experience uh, a, what's called demonic burns on their body. And uh, these burns will look just like sunburn, but they will be patched 
uh, instead of the whole back being sunburn, uh, there'll just be a patch somewhere on the back or on the leg or on the hand or the face that looks like sunburn. And uh, these are known as uh, demonic burns. Uh, you may find that uh, an individual person may have a, a heart that has been placed on their body and uh, it has a subliminal message. Not all of them uh, are, are bad, but some of them could have a subliminal message where a heart represents love. You may have a person who may have a heart on their, their arm or on their uh, body somewhere. Uh, which indicates that they are in love. Uh, it could have a person's name in front of it, or it could also mean that they love something that they're involved with. So the, the heart and the tattoos with the heart, they always have different meanings, and uh, that, that would be worth questioning someone about just to see if uh, they come up and say, no, it means that I, I love my... Uh, I love my new car, or I love this uh, place called Haiti. I, I went there and visited. Uh, I enjoyed that. So can a Christian become a, a, a person who is possessed by demons? I have found nowhere in the scriptures that a Christian can be possessed by a demon. However, they can be influenced by demons. I hope that you enjoyed this, this uh, information today. Let's bow now in a word of closing prayer. So before I close in prayer, let me just say one thing to you. Uh, the information that I presented in this message or educational program for you is uh, information that can help you to understand demonic possession. Uh, are the facts real? What I found are true to, to what I believe is out there. Uh, I believe we can be uh, influenced by the devil. I believe that the devil is real, and, and I believe that uh, there are powers out there uh, that we are unaware of that can affect our lives and the lives of Christians uh, in, in all churches of all denominations. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now in closing. And again, I want to thank you for listening to our uh, video uh, on demonic possession. Our kind Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this uh, audio that we have on uh, demonic possession. Hopefully it has opened the eyes or answered some of the questions that we may have as Christians. And as we continue our study in the history of Satan, we ask that you bless us during this time, Lord, and help us to open our Bibles and to study your word and to, to understand the things that are important for our growth as Christians. We ask that you'll bless those that we've put on the prayer list. Be with those, Lord, who are suffering uh, in our churches and in communities. And be with the pastors and the deacons and the Sunday school teachers that lead their churches in a spirit-filled way. Let the Spirit of God dwell with them. For we do ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.